Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get Dad for Father's Day? Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row1 and save 15% off your order when you check out Row 1 Brand's Vintage Sports Pictorium Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for Dad this Father's Day. If he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 Vintage NFL Helmet Poster. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row1. Every once in a while, a ball player comes along without much fanfare. He proves himself to be a star, but maybe not the biggest star on the team. But without him, the team might not be as good as history remembers. The New York Yankees, one of the most illustrious teams in the history of sport, had one such guy back in the 1950s. No, it wasn't Mantle or Berra or Ford. It was Gil McDougald. And next, on Sports Forgotten Heroes, we're going to take a look back at one of baseball's most unassuming stars of the 1950s, Gil McDougald. This is Sports Forgotten Heroes, a tribute to the stars who shaped the games we love to watch and the games we love to play. Stars who provided us with many thrills, but when their time was up, they faded away. We'll take a look back at their spectacular careers, their moments of fame, even if it was just for one season or just one game. And now, here's your host, Warren Rogan. Hello and welcome to the latest edition of Sports Forgotten Heroes. I certainly hope everyone out there is doing well, staying safe, and getting ready for what we hope will be a thrilling, shortened version of the 2020 baseball season. You know, while it's hard to figure out how this season will ultimately play out, and by that I mean who will benefit most by a 60-game season, one thing is for sure. Whether it's seasons past or this year, we can certainly look at the rosters of several big league clubs and pinpoint the non-superstar names who are the quote-unquote glue of the team, the guys whose value to the team might not be as evident as, say, a Cody Bellinger, Christian Yelich, Mike Trout, or Jose Altuve, guys who are not loud, but their contributions cannot be overlooked. I'm talking about players like Michael Brantley of the Astros, or Nick Marcakis of the Braves, or Paul DeYoung of the Cardinals, or even Cattell Marte of the D-backs. Guys who might light up the highlights, but are not the superstars or most marketable players on their teams. And today, I'm going to look back at the career of one of those types of ball players, Gil McDougald, with a terrific researcher who spends most of his time writing about players from the dead ball era, Bill Lamb. A fan of the then New York Giants, Lamb became a fan of McDougald because they were members of the same parish way back when. Gill played 10 years for the New York Yankees, making his debut in 1951 and hanging up his cleats after the 1960 season. During that time, the Yankees won eight pennants and five World Series, now, I'm not saying the Yankees wouldn't have done as well without Gill, but there's no denying his contributions to the team were of great magnitude. He could play second, third, or short, could go deep in the hole, had as accurate an arm as anyone, came up in the clutch with a big hit, and immediately drew praise from all those around him. Off the field, Gill was a solid citizen, too, and we'll get into all of that, including his role in helping people who needed cochlear implants to help them hear. Gill, unfortunately, was also involved in one of baseball's most horrific events, the line drive that effectively ended the career of one of the game's brightest young stars, Herb Score. While Score played for a couple of seasons after the incident, there is no question 
that Scores' career was dramatically impacted in a negative way after this unfortunate incident with McDougald. Now, before we get into today's show, I'd like to remind everyone, you can follow Sports Forgotten Heroes on Twitter, at SportsFHeroes. Look for the Sports Forgotten Heroes page on Facebook. Look up Sports Forgotten Heroes on Instagram, or visit SportsFH.com for more information about the forgotten heroes I talk about. Again, that's SportsFH.com. Another reminder, if you have an idea for a forgotten hero you'd like to know more about, please go to sportsfh.com and there you'll see just how you can reach out to me. And as always, thanks for listening. Okay, so Gil McDougald, one of the key ingredients to the great New York Yankee teams of the 1950s. And let's get into today's show now with my guest, Bill Lamb. Hey, Bill, welcome to Sports Forgotten Heroes. So glad you could join us. Thank you, Arna. Appreciate being invited. You bet. Hey, you know, before we get into Gil and his terrific yet, albeit forgotten, career, I need to explore your fandom a little. Now, you grew up in New York during the 1950s when the city was... I grew up in New Jersey. Okay, all right. And we're very fussy about that. (laughs) Okay. Everybody thinks that New Jersey is a suburb of New York, but it's not. All right. We're our own state. (laughs) Yes, you are. Okay, how about this? You grew up in the metropolitan area during the 1950s when New York City was the center of the baseball world. Three teams, the Yankees, the Dodgers, and the Giants. And the Yankees That's for sure. Yeah, and the Yankees and Giants played basically within walking distance of each other. Um the Yankees Well I could tell you a story. Yeah, sure. That if you wanted to see a game at Yankee Stadium in the in the in the nineteen fifties, there was virtually no par- parking at all around the stadium. So you would drive to the polo grounds, hmm. park there and walk across the Macumas Dam Bridge oh, well, to there get you to the go. stadium. It was about 10 minutes. Yeah, like I said, walking distance. Uh, I've driven by Coogan's Bluff many a time. I, I also grew up in, well, I grew up in the New York area, not New Jersey. <laughs> okay. Um, but the Yankees, you know, as we all know, they were the perennial winner and had all the greats. The Dodgers were also one of baseball's great teams back then. Not that the Giants weren't. So with three teams to choose from, how does one choose the Giants to call their favorite? Well, in my case, it was simple. My parents were Giants fans. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that more or less dictated that. A lot of it had to do with where you were from and uh, maybe even your ethnicity. Uh, If you were Italian, uh, I think Jewish, uh, the Puerto Rican fans, they tend to gravitate toward the Yankees. So do people from the suburbs, Westchester and New Jersey. Uh, The Giants tend to to have the traditional Irish uh, New York metropolitan area. And Brooklyn was a a world unto itself. Uh, uh, Brooklyn had virtually no following in New Jersey when I was growing up. It was primarily the Yankees and with the a smattering of Giants fans. Mm-hmm. And well, a lot of it had to do with, with you know, what influences were brought to bear upon you when you were, uh, you know, a kid. Mm-hmm. What was it like to be a Giants fan, especially back then when baseball ruled the roost? What about your friends and family? Were they all Giants fans as well? Well, m- my family were Giants fans. Oh, virtually all of my friends were Yankees fans. And they thought it basically quaint. <laughs> or curious that there somebody that was playing with them every day didn't root for the Yankees, rooted for the Giants. So it's like being contrary. But the, they tolerated it because the Yankee fans had this innate superiority. They didn't really care uh, uh, who you rooted for if you didn't root for the Yankees because uh, the Yankees were the only team that mattered. Um, so it was uh, uh, something that you got used to. It's like having a natural inferiority complex. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, I imagine Willie Mays had to be one of your favorite Giants back then, but there were also guys like Alvin Dark and 
Bobby Thompson and Monty Irvin, Sal Magley, Larry Jansen. Who were your top three or four favorites and why? Well, my two favorite players were Davey Williams, the second baseman, and Don Mueller, the right fielder. And why is that? Uh, one, because the first time I ever went to a game, uh, my dad uh, put us uh, in the like second row right by the right field foul pole, and I sat behind Don Mueller the whole game. And I don't really remember why Davey Williams was, was one of my favorites, except that he was not particularly big. He wasn't a particularly outstanding hitter. He was just a good, reliable player. And I don't know why I took a shine to him, uh, but I did. Uh, and so they, those are my two favorites. Mm-hmm. And I can tell you a story about Willie Mays. Sure. Um, and I say this as a Giants fan, uh, and this is based upon my recollection of things. Um, in the 1950s, uh, nobody in the metropolitan area that I was acquainted with thought that Mays was a better player than Mickey Mantle. And I'm saying that as a Giants fan, nobody thought that. Wow. Uh, as their careers progressed and the Giants went out to the stadium and, and Mays continued to put up those numbers and Mantle began to uh, have physical problems, uh, that swung some. But during the 1950s, I don't know anybody who thought that Willie Mays was a better player than Mickey Mail. At least if there were such people, they weren't hanging out with me. Wow, that's I'm saying, saying a that lot. as a Giants fan. That's saying a lot. You know, um, one other thing, as a Giants fan, no doubt you probably didn't like the Dodgers or the Yankees, maybe even hated them. Would that be accurate? Well, I think the, the Dodgers was a matter of disdain. Whereas the Yankees, I hated the Yankees. I hated the Yankees uh, up until about 1990. I, it was just that smug, superior, we always win, we expect to win, and we do win. It's, it was intolerable. So I, was the, I, I didn't care for the, the Dodgers. Nobody who rooted for the Giants did. But I actually hated the Yankees. So when the Dodgers and the Yankees would play in the series, would you even watch? And if you did, was it like, well, I hope I'd the Dodgers I'd watch and hope they win. both lose. <laughs> I got gotcha. you. Actually, I would root for the Dodgers over yeah. the Yankees. Yeah, I, I figured as much. So let me ask you this. How yes. does a fan of the New York Giants become a fan of one of the key ball players of the New York Yankees? Well, it's, it's a personal connection. It's not that I knew him, but when uh, Gil was playing for the Yankees in the mid-1950s, he lived in Nutley, New Jersey. I was in grammar school at the time, and I lived one town over in Bloomfield. And we were both members of the same parish. And that was a big deal. St. Thomas the Apostle. And so having somebody uh, uh, from the parish being a major league ball player, uh, and besides the fact that everybody, even people who are Yankee haters like me, he was really a nice man. In addition to being a very good ball player, a nice man. Everybody spoke well of him. Mm-hmm. My parents, uh, people in the parish, uh, people in the playground, everybody liked Gil McDougal, even if you didn't like the rest of the Yankees. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in your article, you write that he was, well, a true gentleman off the field. Tell us a little bit about the man, not necessarily about the ball player, but about the man. Well, I'm not going to claim that he and I were, were, were close friends. I mean, I would see him like very, very rarely uh, around town because he's, a, he's an adult and I'm just a, a grammar school kid. But his, his reputation preceded him. He, uh, he was very involved in all sorts of civic and community matters. And uh, uh, he was very obliging in terms of when the, the parish or the community needed a speaker or somebody to uh, – to pitch in and to make an appearance so they could raise some funds. He's a very obliging, very humble, uh, very modest man who was a terrific ball player. And so uh, everybody in the area took a shine to him. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't know how deep your research into Gil McDougal went, but one thing I think I do need to mention is, especially in today's day and age, He didn't see color, did he? I mean, after all, he adopted a couple of children who were biracial. And in your article, you said you don't see color or religion when you adopt. Who cares? We just wanted kids. And he had a lot of kids. He had a really big family. He and his wife had four children of their own. And in addition to that, uh, I believe that they fostered children 
uh, uh, as their children were growing up. And as I understand it, he and his wife also wanted to adopt as their children were growing and uh, out of the house and uh, uh, to fill the void, they, they wanted to adopt. And now their problem was their age. Mm-hmm. Uh, but apparently, if you were willing to take, quote unquote, less desirable children, um, they could overlook that. So he he adopted three children, two of which were mixed race, and he raised them just as if he just as if they were his own. All right, let's get on the field here. First of all, Gil McDougal was not imposing physically. In fact, he was rail thin, especially before he got to the majors. Talk about his size and his early athletic acumen, and obviously the fact that he didn't make his high school baseball team until his senior year. He actually was an outstanding basketball player at Commerce High School in San Francisco. That's where he attracted attention. As you mentioned, he did not make his uh, high school baseball team until his senior year, and then he got injured and only played in a handful of games. Uh, he developed uh, as, a, as a semi-pro player uh, in the San Francisco area and was signed uh, by the Yankees, I think, around 1948. But he was not physically imposing. He was a man of average size, uh, uh, 5'11", 6 foot, maybe about 170, 175 pounds, and he had some very peculiar uh, mannerisms, uh, mm-hmm. particularly his batting stance. Mm-hmm. Uh, it really had to be seen. It was it, I could describe it. It's sort of splayed legged, open to the pitcher, with the bat laid off almost like parallel uh, with, with the ground, and yet he could whip it through the strike zone and hit the ball everywhere. There was, it was very difficult to defense because from line to line, he, he put the ball in play. So uh, he was not an impressive guy to look at, uh, but when you put him on the diamond and see what he could do, um, he could he could do virtually everything except hit for I would say exceptional power numbers. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know when you describe that, I was trying to think of a ball player in recent times who might have somewhat of a similar stance, and the guy that came to mind played for the Angels, Brian Downing. He had that like wide open stance. Is is that a similar type of stance that, that McDougal had, or is there somebody in the game today whom you might be able to compare him to? Regarding Brian Downing, from the waist down, he would look a lot like McDougal. But McDougal had the bat so laid off, it it, it was it was really striking uh 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 how he could actually get the get the the bat through the through the hitting zone, but he he could manage it. He had very very good hands and wrists, and exceptional hand eye coordination. But I can't think of anybody off the top of my head who uh, batted like Gil McDougal, and that's probably not an accident because I suspect that you know while the 1940s and maybe the 1950s, if a guy could hit, they'd leave him alone. But I think nowadays it, that that batting stance would have been corrected in Little League. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Where do you think his love for the game of baseball came from, and why did he pursue it like he did? After all, like you said, he didn't make his high school varsity team. He didn't make the high school team until his senior year, and then an injury reduced his playing time to like five games. He was a decent basketball player. Where did his pursuit of baseball and his love of baseball come from? That's not something that I could really answer. All I can say is that he persisted, even though he didn't have a great deal of success in high school. Uh, he stayed with it uh, rather than, you know, taking up golf or, or trying to be a college basketball player. And as he stayed with it, uh, his skills uh, matured, he improved. And uh, once he got assigned, uh, it was almost a straight uh draft line uh, through the Yankee farm system. Uh, success breeds success. Uh, he had determination. He had obviously natural ability uh, and he had some intangibles mm-hmm. and, uh, he, and, and he was married real early and starting a family. So if he was going to make this a career, he had to be really serious about it. Mm-hmm. There was another famous ball player from that area, a guy by the name of Joe DiMaggio. Do you think McDougal, um, or DiMaggio had any influence on McDougal's love for the game? 
I don't know. Uh, they only were teammates for one season uh, in 1951. And uh, while while Joe was from the San Francisco area, by the time Gil was playing in high school and and and, and uh, semi pro, uh, I think uh, Joe DiMaggio was like a cosmopolitan, a citizen of the United States. Uh, mm. I don't know how much time he spent back in San Francisco. I don't know of any influence that he had over McDougal. Um, there was just too much of an age difference, talent difference, status difference. Um, if he did have an influence, perhaps he led by, he showed by example that you showed up, you put in a day's work, you always performed your best because the person in the stand might be the, be a first timer who's never seen you before. This is your first and only chance to make an impression on them. So, to the extent that they were very serious about the playing ball and uh, always gave it their best, they had that in common. But whether McDougal needed to see DiMaggio in action to adopt that kind of attitude, or whether that was just inborn in him, uh, I tend to think the latter. Mm hmm. So, you know, he, he really loved the game, like you said. And also, like you said, he wound up playing for a semi-pro team in the San Francisco area that had ties to the Boston Braves. Is there anything you can tell us about that team or how Gill got connected with them? Well, as you mentioned, there was a, a Braves sc scout named Bill Lawrence who apparently had an interest in him. Uh, but uh, uh, there was a fellow named Joe Devine who was mm -hmm. the Yankees uh, as, as a West Coast, uh, West Coast scout. And those are the only two that I'm aware of that had any interest in McDougal. I think most scouts were put off by that peculiar batting stance. Uh, but uh, Gil chose uh, to, to go with the Yankees. Uh, uh, what influenced him to do that, I can't really say. But obviously, it was a very wise choice in the long term. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so he plays for this semi-pro team, Joe Devine, the West Coast scout for the Yankees sees him. And while a lot of scouts were turned off because of Gill's peculiar batting stance, that didn't bother Devine. He just saw a guy who could hit and, like you said, spray it around the field every place. So he's ultimately signed by the Yankees, making like $200 a month, gets a $1,000 signing bonus, Man, he didn't disappoint. And again, like you said, he moved through the minors pretty quickly. What was it about his game? Well, I think it's that, it, first of all, you have, to, you have to acknowledge that he had natural talent. Uh, uh, and uh, he was both an offensively and defensively uh, able uh, prospect. Uh, so Class C, not a problem. Class Next year, Class B, not a problem. He's, he's again, the leading player or a leading infielder in both the, the uh, leagues he plays in. They skip him in 1950 over Class A because he's moving along. He's progressing so rapidly that he goes right to double A. And, again, he doesn't disappoint. It's, it's a matter of uh, he's a serious player. He's got natural ability. He comes to play every day, and he performs. So, Obviously, you keep on promoting a guy like that until he, until he either uh, either makes the big club or he shows you that he that he's reached his uh, his uh, top level of performance and he can't go any further. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like you said, uh, Class C. He played there in 1948 for the Twins Falls Cowboys in the Pioneer League, and he hits 340. They bump him up to Class B the following year. 1949, he hits 344 in the Western International League. And then in 50, he jumps Class A, like you said, ends up in double A for the Beaumont Roughnecks. And he leads the league with 187 hits, was the MVP, hit 336. And his manager was Rogers Hornsby. Can you tell us at all about Hornsby as a manager and you know, he didn't particularly care for young ball players. Sort of a, a tough thing for a minor league manager, wouldn't you say? Well, Rogers Hornsby was a very prickly personality. 
Uh, he had been a, an, an exceptional ball player, probably the greatest right-handed hitter in Major League Baseball history. And like all great players, he had very little tolerance for for a lack of talent uh, and uh, perhaps uh, not the degree of patience uh, or tact that uh, we might expect uh, today. Uh, but one one thing was for sure, he could recognize talent when he saw it. And even though McDougal uh, had some awkward mannerisms, particularly in the plate at the plate, he he could make contact. And, and, and Hornsby, perhaps unexpectedly, took a real shine to him, and it was a big promoter uh, of uh, of uh, McDougal. He uh, he encouraged them. He didn't tamper with his batting style because it was effective, uh, and uh, he uh, he was. Uh, uh, a real supporter uh, of uh, McDougal, particularly the following season when uh, he unexpectedly uh, got a chance to go to Yankees camp. Yeah, he really promoted him. He he thought that this guy had the talent, and it's it's just I find it very interesting how Hornsby sort of you know had this reputation, like you said, as a prickly guy who who really just. Didn't like to work with young ball players, but yet here he is, manager of a double A team. So he's going to be surrounded by young ball players, and he takes this liking to Gil McDougal. It, it it is something you would not have expected of Hornsby. Many young players, in particular, who played for him, did not like him at all. Uh, but he and the McDougal hit it off. Uh, Perhaps it was that no nonsense uh, attitude uh, about you know, putting in a day's work and uh, playing your best, and uh, uh, whatever the intangibles were that uh, McDougal had, uh, Hornsby appreciated them and became a, a, a very, very uh, avid supporter uh, uh, of uh, McDougal and was all for him being promoted, uh, even though uh, the Yankees seemed to be overstocked with infielders at the time. Yeah, sure. And in 1951, McDougal was ticketed for AAA, but the Korean War was very much in the news back then, and several Yankees were called up into service. So Gill went to spring training with the Yankees, and he made an immediate impression on their manager at the time, Casey Stengel. What did Stengel see in his game, and why did the Yankees give Gill the shot they did? Well, I think it's a combination of circumstances. First of all, it was the uncertainty of uh, of the situation. Uh, Jerry Coleman was a Marine aviator, a Marine Reserve aviator, so they didn't know if he was going to be called up. Bobby Brown uh, had, had, a, had a reserve commission, whether he was going to be called up. Billy Martin had already been drafted, and Billy Johnson – who was the incumbent third baseman, was holding out. Uh, so th- it was a very fluid situation. And I think the thing that really caught Stengel's eye was versatility. McDougal, mm-hmm. although he uh, had been primarily a second baseman, he could move him around the infield. And uh, that was the thing that uh, Stengel always prized, having uh, one, one person uh, who could handle three positions rather than having three different guys at, on the bench. Uh, so he gave him a chance and he capitalized on it. He performed very well in spring training. He made himself sort of indispensable, particularly given the uncertainty that the Yankees were confronted with regarding their other infielders. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he sticks with the club and it wasn't too long before he became a regular. Tell us a little bit about Gill's rookie season and the game that solidified his place in the lineup. You know, six RBIs, I think it was, in right. one inning. I mean, at that time, a, a, I believe a Yankee record. I mean, he didn't start off in the lineup. He saw very limited playing time. But, man, once he got a chance, you couldn't get him out. Once he got a chance, he capitalized, uh, and he had a, that extraordinary uh, game against uh, the St. Louis Browns, as a lot of players tended to do. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, his versatility made him very valuable because uh, uh, he could uh, both spell Bobby Brown uh, against left-handed pitching at third base, and J- Jerry Coleman was having injury problems uh, and uh, wasn't the world's best hitter against right-handed pitching. Uh, so he could also uh, shift over and play second. So he made himself very useful to Casey Stengel as being basically uh, uh, a guy he could put in 
depending on who was pitching or depending on how the health and and hitting situation was of his other infielders. Uh, so uh, he got a lot of playing time, uh, and he performed. I mean, he of all the Yankees on that team, you know, Joe DiMaggio, uh, Yogi Berra, a young Mickey Mantle, a Gene Woodling, the man with the highest Yankee batting average that season was Gil McDougal. Yeah, it's crazy to think that um, he out-hit all of them, or at least had a higher average. In fact, he had a 306 batting average. Um, that weird batting stance produced 14 home runs. He had 63 RBIs, 14 stolen bases. He was the league's rookie of the year. I mean, just a really solid first full year of baseball but what about his defense um he bounced around the infield like you said he was very versatile what was his natural position and just how good was he defensively he came up as a second base and i think that is the position that he preferred but if if the choice is being on the bench or getting in the game and playing a different position he was up for he was up for whatever a single wanted him to do um he had a lot of natural assets but he did not if you were looking at him, uh, and you're the you know just a typical fan, he doesn't he isn't flashy. He's not particularly graceful, uh, but he has very sure hands. Uh, he has an accurate arm. Uh, he has defensive intelligence. He's rarely out of position or be, or asleep uh, during a, during a, the game. Uh, but he's not going to he's not going to catch your eye. He isn't he isn't like a, a, a a, a flashy guy uh, with the glove. It's just that he makes all the plays. He does. He doesn't mess up the routine plays, and he'll he'll give you a a, a decent shot at making the hard play. Uh, it's reliability, I think, more than anything, which is uh, the uh, the hallmark of his uh, fielding uh, abilities. Mm-hmm. Now, of course, the Yankees had the best team in baseball. As much as that might be difficult to hear for a, an old New York Giants fan. Yes, um, I remember. <laughs> I was just very young, but the, the the Giants actually, you know, were the were that year's designated victim in the World Series. <laughs> I mean, like you said, they had DiMaggio and Mantle, a young Yogi Berra. Brown, Coleman, Vic Rashi, Eddie Lopat, the list goes on. How did Gil McDougal fit in with the team? Well, as far as the clubhouse goes, the Yankees, uh, while they, a few years later, they had, uh, you know, they had some incidents involved, but that was a very buttoned down corporate uh, type of uh, locker room. And he fit right in. He was a serious man, a pleasant man, uh, uh, but not the kind of guy that would that would call attention to himself or cause a lot of commotion. He was hardly a clubhouse lawyer, and that's the Yankee style, you know, the the three piece suit and the and the briefcase. So he fit right in perfectly uh, with that sort of uh, button down image that the Yankees uh, promoted. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of times we talk about what's called the sophomore jinx. You just don't play or you don't do as well as you did in your rookie season. And he sort of had a sophomore jinx as well. I mean, he did make the all-star team, but his second year, um, you know, he became a real regular. He was uh, played 152 games, uh, had 555 at-bats, you know, played appearance-wise well over 600. But his numbers dropped in virtually every category. He went from a 306 average to a 263 average. He dropped in home runs. What happened his, his second year? I don't think that anything particularly happened. I think what was important about his second year is that he established that he wasn't a one-year flash in the pan. While the numbers, as you mentioned, are down, they're not down, you know, remarkably. Uh, he established himself as, hey, I'm a bona fide major league player. Uh, I uh, I can play both uh, you know, second base, third base. I'm a reliable hitter, if not if not a particularly uh, – uh, uh, you know, eye-catching, uh, batting average type guy, but uh, I can make all the plays for you in the field, and I can, I can contribute my share. Uh, for example, 78 RBIs that season. Uh, I think what he did is he established that he was a bona fide major league player because lots of 
fellows have had a great first year. Because I remember Walt Dropo, mm-hmm. uh, 1950. You would think he was the, he was the, the second coming of Jimmy Fox, mm-hmm. and he never uh, had a season anything like it. Whereas McDougal, uh, if you look at his career, there is a, a very narrow range. He's, he gives you the same numbers within a, a, a fairly a tight uh, a sphere uh, year after year. And while his numbers were down in 52, uh, they'll be up again in 53. And that's the way he did it. He mm-hmm. just, there wasn't these dramatic fluctuations. He was a very steady, reliable player. Mm-hmm. And really, when you when you consider and you look at his career in a, as a whole, one area where I think he really excelled was in the postseason. Now, remember, at least you remember, and hopefully everybody out there remembers as well, there were no playoffs back then. You won the league, and then you played in the World Series. So eight times in his career, the Yankees won the American League pennant and played in the World Series. Five times, they won the World Series. Overall, he played in 53 games. Sure, he only hit 237, but he had seven home runs and 24 RBI. And most of those home runs came at clutch moments. What was it about the postseason that brought out such clutch performances and his defense, too? Well, that's not a question that I can answer. All I can say is that he did it. Uh, while, while, while you're correct that his numbers are in the abstract, they're not particularly stunning. It is that they came at very propitious times, uh, and they drove in a, a lot of runs. So why he was a clutch player is is one of those things that's unanswerable. It's just he was. When you needed a clutch base hit or a, a solid to, to play uh, on defense, you could count on him. He would come through for you. Uh, and uh, why some players can do that and why some players can't is a mystery and i certainly can't answer it all i can say is that when the chips were down he was a very solid reliable player who often came through for the yankees Mm -hmm. he also had a couple of unfortunate incidents throughout his career and we're going to start with 1955 it was really an interesting year sure he hit 285 he had 13 home runs and 53 ribbies But there was an incident that took place in batting practice that wound up having quite the impact on his life. Can you tell us about it, please? Well, no one realized it at the time, but uh, during batting practice, uh, he took a foul ball in the head that was hit by Bob Surf. And uh, uh, he was checked out, and and obviously he was stunned, but no one thought that it was anything of particular consequence at the time. But undetected was a small hairline fracture in his skull and some damage to his inner ear. And over time, these would have profound consequences. But not at the time. No one, the day after that happened, the week after that happened, the year after that happened, Mm -hmm. would perceive that he had been affected by this. But over time, they would would have very, very deleterious effects on his health. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let's jump ahead here. Several years after his playing days were over, he went on to coach Fordham University, and he left the team because of hearing problems that were caused by that incident. And later, an article was written about Gill and his hearing struggles, and that led to some very good things. Tell us about the article and what happened afterwards, and ultimately, I guess you should start with what that beaning, not beaning, but being hit in the head by that ball actually did to Gil McDougal. Well, over time, it affected his hearing to the point where he continually lost hearing until by the time he had been out of baseball for uh, probably a couple of decades, he was almost totally deaf. And he, you know, it, it was very difficult for him because uh, uh, he couldn't communicate. He couldn't talk on the phone. Uh, he avoided old timers games. Uh, he just became very uh, despondent about his inability to, to, to even participate in, in routine conversations. Uh, what happened is around 1994, uh, New York Times sports writer Ira Burkow wrote an article about, about his situation in the New York Times. And someone 
apparently uh, brought this article to the attention of the uh, chief of Odo Laren. I can't pronounce this word. Neither the, can the I. Chief <laughs> ear guy at New at New York University Medical Center, and uh, they uh, began to make uh, inquiries as to whether or not he would be a candidate for a cochlear implant, which was at time uh, at the time was a cutting edge a medical uh, technique designed to re-stimulate the uh, uh, the, uh, the hearing uh, senses, and uh, he eventually uh, uh, underwent the surgery. And for six weeks, uh, they had him, uh, I guess, bandaged up, uh, and they didn't know whether the surgery had been a success or not. And then when they finally removed the bandages and subjected him to, uh, I guess, ordinary conversation, he could hear again. And it had a remarkable effect on his uh, on, on his life. And from that day on, uh, till the time of his death, he was a real uh, champion uh, of uh, the procedure being uh, being. Uh, uh, made available, particularly to children, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and that's that's a co- that's a controversial thing because, uh, and I'm not an authority on the deaf community, but some people don't think that they are in need of such type of uh, remedial medical treatment. But that's a different ma- that's a different issue. The, the question the question is, did he benefit from it? And the answer to that is enormously. Mm-hmm. I wonder how good or how long he would have remained at Fordham. You know, everything's conjecture, you know, had he been able to hear. I mean, it was ultimately his hearing that led to him resigning as the coach of, of, of Fordham University. It, it's hard to say. Uh, you know, life circumstances uh, are unpredictable. Uh, but uh, he had been successful at Fordham, which was no mean feat because, uh, let's face it, uh, the Bronx is a cold weather climate. Mm-hmm. We don't we don't have the uh, twelve months a year to play baseball. He's limited to three scholarships. Uh, so uh, while New York City is and, and the surrounding area is certainly a hotbed of baseball, uh, you know, you, you ask, you tell a kid, uh, you know, you want to play a uh, hundred and something games at Arizona State, or you want to play twenty three games in the freezing cold at Fordham. <laughs> Uh, what's he going to tell you? So he certainly had recruiting disadvantages, but notwithstanding that, he had some very successful teams at Fordham. Uh, and uh, he might well have continued on, but that's something that's unknowable. Sure, you know? sure. Let's get back to his days with the Yankees. I want to talk about a couple other events that he was involved in. I'm going to mention a name or an event, and I'd like for you to tell me about it. And let's start with Game 7, Don Larson. Yes. The, you know, there's a, n- a number of different plays. I can remember I was in grammar school at the time, and the, all the World Series games, unlike today, were always during the daytime. Mm-hmm. And uh, we would all race home to see if we could catch the last few innings of that game. And Don Larson, who was, you know, a, a journeyman pitcher who had had some terrible seasons with the Browns before the Yankees got him, he was throwing one of those games. Uh, but still, he, there were some very... Uh, uh, helpful uh, defensive plays made behind him, one of which was made by Gil McDougal. There's a hot shot. I think it was Jackie Robinson. Hit down to Andy Carey at third, and, and and Carey didn't catch it. He deflected it, but he deflected it to McDougal coming uh, to his right to, to cover the hole. McDougal grabbed the carom and threw Robinson out, and that was among, I'd say, maybe two or three plays that actually preserved uh, the Larson uh, perfect game. Mm-hmm. I probably should have mentioned this one before Larson, because um, this really led to McDougal becoming, well, the centerpiece of the Yankees, at least the infield. Phil Rizzuto retiring and leaving a hole at shortstop. Yes. What had happened was that uh, Phil w- was definitely uh, uh, losing uh, uh, his bat that had become a uh, uh, Anemic. He could. He wouldn't even hit 200 uh, his, his final season. And the Yankees were looking to break in a replacement, and they tried a number of flashy fielders like uh, uh, Billy Hunter and Willie Miranda, and they had some prospects down in the uh, minor leagues, but they they weren't progressing as as had hoped. So when the Yankees lost in the 55 series, they had booked a, a, a postseason trip to Japan. Rizzuto did not go on it, Mm -hmm. but most of the Yankees did. And this afforded uh, Stengel the opportunity to try out uh, some uh, uh, possible replacements for Rizzuto, one of which was McDougal, who was not 
a natural shortstop or particularly thrilled about playing shortstop. But for the good of the team, absolutely, he'd give it a go. And he, again, he, he outperformed expectations. He was not a glove man like Miranda or Hunter, but he was a, a very solid shortstop, a reliable one. And unlike Miranda and Hunter, he could hit. Mm. So uh, I think that is what uh, uh, persuaded Stengel that, uh, you know, if if Rizzuto really is done, uh, then – and these other two and the prospects down on the, on the farm don't make the grade, I can always rely upon McDougal because I know he can do the job. He's just showed me that he can. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What about Sandy Amaros? Well, he, he Sandy Amaros was a uh, a journeyman left fielder who made who made a catch that we still remember him for. That's why we're mentioning his name right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, in the pantheon of, of of Dodger players from the 1950s, he's way down the list. <laughs> yeah, and, and he made that spectacular catch. And I think Gill was was the, was one of the guys. Was the guy doubled off? Yes, yeah, I could be wrong about that. No, but you're correct. Was. You're correct. Um, it was a spectacular play, um, and uh, you know it, it. It may very well have. He doesn't catch that ball. It's probably good for at least two runs, and the Yankees are still up with men in scoring position. Everything changes. Sure, but you he know, catches it. He double McDougal, and that's all Johnny Padres needed. Yep. You know. It's really unfortunate, but sometimes an athlete can go through a career, have a terrific career, if not a spectacular career, and sometimes they're just, you know, they they just chug along, and for whatever reason, they don't get the notoriety that they deserve. Sometimes when when I look back at the career of Gil McDougal, I think to myself, this guy was better than what what he's remembered for if he's remembered the guy had a really solid career and sometimes a spectacular career and we talked about how good he was in the postseason perhaps though there are times when an athlete is remembered for a really unfortunate incident through no fault of his own yeah, and when Bill you Buck, look Buck. back, yeah, well, yeah, Bill Buckner. And when you look back at the career of Gil McDougal, there is one play, one incident that is just so darned unfortunate that ties him to this player, this pitcher. And in a way, this is for some how perhaps Gil McDougal is remembered 1957 Herb score oh I remember very well I did not see it happen my dad told me about it and to give you a personal angle being a Yankee hater during the mid-1950s the only team that was a serious contender to give the Yankees a hard time were the Cleveland Indians Mm -hmm. they actually even beat them once in 54 Mm -hmm. in 55 Herb score comes up and he is a sensation uh, he throws hard. He has a great curveball. Uh, he's just terrific. He's the American League Rookie of the Year. The following year, he wins 20 games. He, he, he is, if you're a Yankee hater, guys like Herb Score, you love them. <laughs> and it's, 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 it's early in the season. I think it's early May. And it's, uh, they're playing the Yankees. And uh, he's, Gil McDougal's the second batter. Incidentally, the week before, Yep. And McDougal was like this. He was a line drive hitter. And if you're a hard thrower, you're only like 50 feet away when you finish throwing a fastball. And the week before, he had hit a shot back up the middle that hit Frank Larry, the old Yankee killer, and knocked him right out of the game. But it hit him in the hip. Mm -hmm. Well, this time up, he squares up a, a, a score fastball and hits a bullet right back at him. Score can't even get his hands up. The ball hits him right in the right eye. Mm. The ball ricochets over to Al Smith, the third base, who throws him out. By now, nobody's even – I think I think they actually completed the play, but everybody's running for score. And he's on the ground, and it's, there's blood all over the place, and it's a gruesome sight. And uh, they finally uh, – they're able – I think they got him on his feet. Now, I think he walked off. I don't think he was taken off on a stretcher, but I could be wrong about that. But he's taken to the hospital. He has – Oh, God, countless facial fracture, uh, uh, fractures of the orbit bone or the, the eye socket. 
and they're concerned about whether he's going to lose the sight in that eye. And McDougal is heart sick. Mm-hmm. And he uh, he's despondent because he thinks that, oh, my God, this this great young pitcher, and have I cost him his career? Have I cost him the sight of his eye? He actually tried to go to the hospital. Uh, I think he, uh, Yogi Berra, and Hank Bauer uh, actually attempted to, to go see McDougal that evening, but were not allowed in because he was uh, probably under sedation and not receiving any visitors. Mm-hmm. But finally, word got apparently to the McDougal family, and he got a call from Mrs. McDougal. Ella McDougal called uh, uh, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Gill and said, uh, uh, "Excuse me, Mrs. Score uh, called right, uh, right. Uh, uh, called uh, uh, called Gill and said." No one takes this personally. It's part of the game. Uh, Herb doesn't have any animosity toward you. It was, you were, he was trying to get you out, and you're trying to get a base hit. That's the way the game is played. There are no hard feelings. We wish you well, etc. And while it was a relief for him to hear that, I don't think he ever got over. Yeah, you know, I get that feeling. What that, happened? Yeah, I get that feeling that it it, it really affected him. Um, it did. You know, at least mentally, I mean, he did have a decent season in 57. I mean, he went on to hit 289, was an all-star. I'm looking at the stats here. He led the American League in triples with nine, sacrifice hits with 19. He had 13 home runs, uh, 62 RBI. Um, But it really, uh, it affected him. I think that there's no question about that. He... uh, what happened to score? I remember the next year he came back and he pitched very well his first two or three starts, and then all of a sudden he couldn't find the plate and he'd hurt his arm, and uh, it was a struggle. For, I think the I think the Indians put him on the disabled list for months at a time, and finally uh, they gave up on him and traded him to the White Sox. And McDougal was heart sick. Yeah, because I mean, even though there is no direct correlation between the incident. And, and, and scores arm trouble uh, the following season. Uh, uh, I don't think McDougal ever got over it. Yeah, I mean, score, like you said, he was rookie of the year in, in 55. He went 16 and 10, led the American League in strikeouts with 245, and was rookie of the year. In 56, he was 20 and 9, led the American League in strikeouts with 263. Had a 2.7 ADRA, a league-leading five shutouts, and that was it. In 57, he was 2-1, and one, and that, that, that was the end of that when he got hit. He came back in 58. I'm reading it right here. He went 2-3 and three in 59, 9-11, and, and then he was traded to the White Sox. Right. And he went 5-10, and 1-2, and, and that was it. I mean, he never um, – what a shame. It, for those uh, of your listeners who who don't remember Herb Score, think Sandy Koufax. They were contemporaries, uh, but uh, uh, Score reached stardom about three or four seasons before Koufax, but they had a lot in common. Big leg kick, devastating fastball, tremendous overhand curve, and control problems. Mm. And both were left-handed, of course. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, so... If you don't remember Herb Score, but you do remember Sandy Koufax, they had a lot in common. Mm, interesting comparison. So he, 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 you know, back to McDougal, he had a, a, a good season in '57, despite what had happened. But that was really his last really good year. His batting average in '58 dropped to 250, then 251 and 258. How much of that do you think? can be attributed to what happened with Herb score. Was it that? Was it his age, a combo of both? I mean, after all, when it happened, Gil McDougal was only 29 years old. But after 10 years and at, you know, the young age of 32, he decided to retire. Why? Well, I I think that as far as the decline in his performance the last three seasons, it's all relative. He was not as good as he had been, but he was still a very reliable, solid player. Uh, but I think the, the fact, as you mentioned, uh, I don't know to what extent there was any psychic uh, uh, injury uh, done him. I know that he was very uh, uh, sad that, that Score's career had, had not reached its full potential. 
uh, but I don't know if that affected his his play. Um, I think that people age at different at different rates. Uh, some people are old at thirty, and some aren't. Uh, mm-hmm. He was playing every day, uh, 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 you know, for a team in, uh, that was constantly expected to win. There's an enormous amount of pressure to perform. Um, there's the, the the competition that you face every year because the Yankees are, are overloaded with with fine young players and it's a battle to get a job uh, every season. Over time, uh, they took their toll. That's my speculation, anyway. The bottom line is that as he got older, uh, he he was not the player at at 32 that he was at 25. But that can be said of a lot of players. Mm-hmm. Do, do you think perhaps? He also feared the fact that with expansion coming about and knowing that players would have to be exposed to a draft, that he wanted to be remembered as a Yankee, did not want to uproot his family and move anyplace else but where he was in New Jersey. And despite all of that, um, that, that that's why he decided to call it quits, even though the Angels an expansion team at that time wanted to draft Gill and they even offered him a two year contract. All of that is true. Uh, I think that uh, his time with the Yankees was just about up because uh, by the time the 1961 season uh, would have rolled around, uh, you've got uh, the infield set with Boyer, Kubek, Richardson, and uh, Scourin or whoever was going to replace him at first base. Uh, mm-hmm. Gil was going to be no more than a utility player, and he was going to be exposed to the draft because uh, uh, they had to stock two new teams, and obviously the Yankees were not going to going to place uh, any prospects uh, on their uh, on their list uh, of players who uh, could be uh, taken. There is also the fact that he's got children in school. He has a thriving business, a janitorial service in the metropolitan area. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's he's made his home here now for for ten years. And uh, why, you know, how much is enough? Uh, while Gene Autry made him a very generous uh, two-year contract offer, uh, uh, I think he said, "Look, I've had a great career. Um, this is my new adopted home." My family is settled. I have a good off-season job. Uh, I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to forfeit all that just to play a couple of seasons uh, on the West Coast uh, for a, for an expansion team. Mm-hmm. So it all makes sense to me. Yeah, and and he really was a family man, and we discussed that earlier with the amount of children and grandchildren he had. I, you know, the Mets offered him a job as a scout, and after a few road trips, he called them up and said, I just can't be away from home. Yeah, I don't think that that while he was obviously was away from home quite often as a player, that's different. That's how you're making your living. You can make your living doing other things besides scouting. I also don't think that scouting much appealed to him. Uh, you know, grabbing a, a sandwich and running off to New Haven or running off to somewhere in Pennsylvania and then mm-hmm. the next day you're supposed to be in upstate New York. I don't think that appealed to him at all. Uh, and nor did he need to do it. Uh, I think he wanted to stay in the game because he loved baseball. Uh, but uh, that was not a, a job that I think he found very attractive. So he gave it up rather quickly. And that's when he uh, became, or a short time later, became coach of Fordham University to stay involved with the action on the field. Plus, like you said, he had a pretty good janitorial business set up. So what were his days like after his playing days were over? Well, they were very active. Uh, He was still involved in a lot of uh, civic and community activities. Uh, uh, He was often a a very uh, sought after speaker at, uh, during the, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the off season, uh, uh, and uh, uh, he had his business. Uh, besides the fact he had seven seven kids to keep track of and, and a wife, so it isn't like he had a lot of time on his hands. And and he and he, uh, I know he was a golfer. And being a golfer myself, I know that can take a lot of time because it's sure. not a game you can play in twenty minutes. <laughs> no doubt. You know, I don't think Gil McDougal gets the credit 
he deserves. He was really a key ingredient to a legendary team on which he was definitely overshadowed. You think about the great Yankees teams of recent times, you know, Derek Jeter, the captain who was just this phenomenal offensive talent, but he was sort of the glue that kept that team together. And despite the fact that McDougal didn't hit like Jeter, I liken him to a Jeter-esque type player just who went about his business and kept that team together. So in the end, how should Gil McDougal be remembered? I think uh, Gil McDougal embodies all the things you would want to see in a professional ball player. He, he always gives you his best effort. Uh, he uh, can be counted upon uh, to fill in wherever necessary, even if though it's not his preferred position. Uh, and he, he will give you the big hit or make the big play uh, when called upon. So he, he's sort of like uh, uh, the prototypical professional player. He's the kind of guys, the kind of guy that the Yankees of the 1950s were built around. Sure. They had the great stars, the mantle, uh, Berra, Whitey Ford, but guys like McDougal and Elston Howard, uh, those are the guys that you could count upon every day to give you their best effort and to give you a first rate performance and, uh, the ultimate professional. That's how I'd characterize him. Well, Bill, I want to thank you so much for joining us on sports forgotten heroes. I think you've uh, given us a, a great education on Gil McDougal, certainly a ball player whom many fans just don't remember or in some cases have even heard of. Um, I want to thank you for joining me and got to ask, what are you working on now? Any uh, any bios for Sabre now? Yeah, I've got it, – it's like – when you live in New Hampshire and you're retired, uh, there's not a lot to do. Uh, so uh, I play golf and, and I, I do these little projects. And so I've got some obscure players from the 19th century and the Dead Bull era that I'm working on. So stay tuned to the bio project. And if, you, if you want to know how good Alex Ferson was or always wondered about Maury Euler, it's coming. Well, I'll definitely keep an eye out for those bios. Thank you again, Bill. Thanks so much for joining me. Mario, it was my pleasure. Thank you for calling me. You got it. So would the Yankees have been as dominant a team without McDougal in the lineup? That's a question we will never be able to answer. However, I think it's fair to say that with guys like Mickey Mantle, Yogi Berra, Moose Scourin, Hank Bauer, and Whitey Ford, and the list goes on. The Yankees would have still been the best in the game. But I also think it's very fair to say that with McDougal in the lineup, they were that much better. He did not take anything away from any player. Rather, he fit right in and solidified an already potent lineup. For his career, McDougal hit two seventy six, belted 112 home runs with that most unusual batting stance, and knocked in 576. Certainly not imposing numbers, but what he contributed in the clutch on defense, and the fact that he was named an All-Star five times and was the 1951 Rookie of the Year certainly solidifies his stature as one of the most important figures on one of baseball's greatest teams. Thank you once again to my guest today, Bill Lamb, and thanks to all of you for listening. We'll see you next time on Sports Forgotten Heroes. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. 
Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories, and Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.